today, um, maybe you wonder why today we have more of a festive atmosphere up here, and I'm wearing my vestments. Didn't wear them this summer, mostly because it was just way too hot out here to put anything else on. But today is World Communion Sunday, and this is the last Sunday in a four-part series of preaching on healing. And I give thanks to God for my colleague, my dear friend, and my surrogate son, the Reverend Dr. William Brown, who was here with you last week to lead worship. And he sent me during the week an email that said, send me your outline for your sermon so I know where you were going to go. And it was amazing. He took my outline and made it his own. And it was a lovely sermon. My mom and I watched it last Sunday night uh, from my house. So for this World Communion Sunday, I'm not going with the traditional lessons. But I'm going to go with one because we're talking about healing in the largest sense of God's ability to heal the world. We're reading from Luke, the 12th chapter. The words will sound familiar to you because in Matthew they're called the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus takes his disciples up the hill to teach them. In Luke's gospel, they come down, and it's called the Sermon on the Plain because Jesus comes down from his mountain and teaches the people. So this is seen as the great leveler. And I'm going to be reading beginning at verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How much has changed since last World Communion Sunday? I remember being in a sanctuary with Arlise, who's home now waiting for knee surgery, and we need to hold her in prayer. But we were decorating the front of the church, and people were bringing in breads from around the world. And it's been my tradition just in all the years of my ministry to celebrate World Communion Sunday with a coffee hour that is everyone's favorite, bread and butter one of the best things we could ever hope to eat and share together. People baking homemade bread or bringing bread from their, their family's place of origin. It's always a great experience. And now this morning, here we are, unable to share bread with each other because of the fear of sharing this virus. Some of you bring it from home, and I, when I forget to bring mine from home, which is every time we have communion, we have these nasty little things here with a wafer that is like styrofoam and grape juice that I think has become wine because I think this has been sitting in a factory for some time. But if you look at it, it says, this is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. This day holds some special meaning in my life as well because four years ago on World Communion Sunday was the day I went home and found my husband on the floor. And that began the last week of his life. So every World Communion Sunday, I'm taken back to that moment as well. I'm also taken back to all the times that we have shared communion with joy when I was able to hand you the bread and you were able to dip in the cup, something that we may not be able to do for some time. And so here we are talking about healing the world on a Sunday that we usually celebrate our unity with the world. And here we are looking at all the ways that this virus has separated us one from the other. But communion, which is one of the central understandings that I have of Jesus in the church, 
this is where I feel every time I serve communion again, I feel the presence and power of Christ in our sharing. Communion is what forms me. Communion is what confirmed my call. Because believe it or not, when I was young and felt called to ministry and said to people, I feel called to be a pastor, some of them would say, oh, honey, snap out of it. You were called maybe to marry a pastor or to work in the church or to be a Sunday school director. But it was communion and baptism that confirmed me that my call was to share with you the sacraments, the presence of Christ in a very real way as a means of grace. But communion for us is a sign. It's not a symbol. We're not remembering what Jesus did. We're participating with Jesus. But even though we're unable to share together in the way that we have so many times, communion has been with us. It's part of who we are, and it's part of what we take into the world. And this morning, I want you to think of the strains through Scripture that we read this morning. From the prophet Isaiah, He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The time of the prophets. Through the time of Paul's letter to the Romans, his great theological treatise, and what does he say about our enemies? Love them, just as Jesus commanded. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Outdo one another in showing honor. And then this part that always gets me, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And then the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. Don't worry about this world. Don't worry. Hard to do right now, I know. Don't worry. Because God knows what you need, and the nations of the world strive after these things. But God has given you a kingdom that is unlike anything this world has seen before. And you are to live in the kingdom. And we as Christ's people are called to embody the kingdom in a very real way for each other. Hard to do when we can't even touch each other and shake hands anymore. Very hard to do in a world so divided politically, so divided by what the nations are standing for against one another in the world. So hard when people, even on Facebook, can't seem to say anything nice to those. Facebook amazes me, because who are you talking to on Facebook? The people that you've chosen to be your friends. And then we try to beat them up and change their minds about politics and religion and everything else that happens. But just as the strain of God's will for humankind, God's willing humankind toward peace, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Not it's a possibility, they shall. This is the fulfillment of God's kingdom when the nations of the world come to the holy mountain and understand that the God of Jacob, who is the God of our Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of God our Savior Jesus Christ, is the one who was and is and is to come. We read just those two verses that I love so much that you all know from John. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so the world might be saved through him. This strain of peace and healing and joy and plenty and shalom that comes from the time of the Hebrew scriptures through the promises of Christ's return. A message both of incarnation, of God's word becoming flesh and dwelling in our midst, but also a word of transformation. I believe that the world will be transformed into the likeness of Christ because Christ who came, Christ who died, Christ who was raised will come again. Before he died, he gave us himself in the sacrament of his love for us. And he has promised to come and take us to the feast that has no end. And so even in the midst of pandemic, even in the midst for some of us of grief and death, so very recent, even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of frightening news about our country, the president and his wife and so many people in his administration now sick with the virus, leaving us all concerned, an election coming in about a month that has us so torn apart. What Christ is promising us is healing and wholeness. Healing and wholeness transformation because the world will be redeemed in its fullness of time but until then when we can't gather at the table together 
Remember all the times you have shared communion. Remember all the times that you have taken the bread of one loaf and shared it with each other. And even when we don't have one loaf, because in recent years, people are no longer able to eat gluten. They found that they're allergic to wheat. We may have two loaves and two different cups, but we're still at one table. And even though some of our family in Christ here at Epworth is celebrating at home today around tables with bread and juice or cookies and crackers and coffee or whatever you have, what you've brought with you today, or even these little tiny cups packed in a factory so far away, we are still one in Christ. And we are the bread and we are the wine that goes into the world in the name of Jesus Christ because God in Christ has given us a kingdom that is imperishable, a kingdom that will never be undone, a kingdom that is eternal, a kingdom that has power attached to it because the power of God acts through God's people in all times and all places. So today, what I want you to do as you come to the table is to empty your heart of all that is broken, trusting in the healing power of Christ in your heart. We see so much division in the country right now. We see division politically. We see division among the nations. We see division over whether to wear a mask has become a political statement. And people are accusing people of faith of having no faith because we're gathering in parking lots instead of in the building because we're trying to figure out what is right and trying to discern God's will for keeping us safe. I'll admit to you right now that I'm kind of tired. It's been a hard week. We buried my father this week. Not literally, because he wanted to be cremated so his ashes could be with my mom when her time comes. So my mom is here today. As hard as it is for her to come back without dad, she is here because she knows that this is the source of who we are in Jesus Christ to come and to share the bread and the cup, to come and be part of the greater body as much as we're able. So please come, emptying your heart of all that is false. We have been told so many lies recently by those who are trying to convince us of their will. We've been told that you are anti-police if you're anti-police brutality. We've been told that if you say black lives matter, you mean that police lives don't matter. We've been told that if you think this, you can't think that. It's not true. The people of God do not have to agree on everything to be united. But we have to be able to listen to each other. We have to be able to speak to each other words of love and healing. We have to root out of our own hearts any bigotry or prejudice before we can consider even trying to go into the world. We have to take the words seriously, both of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and of Paul, the great apostle of the church, that if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him water. You do not return evil for evil, but you return evil with good because God in Jesus Christ has come into your heart and you have the kingdom at work in you. And when you leave this place, remember that you leave as the body and blood of Christ because Christ has chosen to live in you. Christ will be working through you. So let your words be words of healing and hope. Even in these difficult days, let your words be words of wholeness and peace. Even starting with your own families and spreading to your neighbors. So if people want to fight with you, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with all. Because the peace of God which passes all understanding is what keeps our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of Christ our Savior. We're going to come to the table, not literally this morning, but we're going to have the table come to us. And I want you to go into the world as best you're able, whether it's remotely, through Facebook, however you're getting along in the world. I want you to greet each other with hope and peace because the world needs to see that example in us if it's ever going to heal. So this morning, as we come to the table, I want you to pray that all that is false in each of our hearts might be taken away so that we might be filled with the love and the power and the peace of Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a song that is probably not as familiar to some of you. We've sung it a few times here, but we've been apart so long. Even if you're not singing in your car, I want you to look at the words. 
Here is grace, here is peace. Christ is with us, he is with us. Know his grace, find his peace. Feast on Jesus here. In this bread there is healing. In this cup there's life forever. In this moment by the Spirit, Christ is with us here. But don't leave him here when you go. Take him with you in your heart, in your words, in your messages of hope and peace. Loving others, loving yourself, loving Christ, and trusting that the day will come when the world will beat its swords into plowshares and its spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up war against nation anymore, and there will be peace. Through God our Savior Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.